Hello, my name is Patrick. Welcome to today's talk. Today we're going to talk about, let me see what I wrote down. Let me see what I wrote down. Nothing can affect you unless you allow it. Oh my gosh, this sucks. This sucks so bad. But it's also pretty awesome when you do realize it, when you do understand it. Nothing can affect you unless you allow it. So as a, as a personal aside, I, th I think it's lovely when something gets stuck in my craw, I, I interpret what's going on in my life or in the world as things being done to me. Basically, what, what I do is I forget who I am. See, I know I'm a divine being in a human body, having a human experience that I chose to have as you are. If you are hearing this and it's resonating with you, that is true for you as well. However, we did not come into this experience to have that knowledge to be at the forefront of our brain. We chose to forget. Now, if you're still living in ego consciousness and, and you're like, why would we do that? That doesn't make any sense. Well, the ego as it is today doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So that makes sense, right? There's a flawed premise that we adhere to is that other people can create in our experience. Let's go over to this book, Asking It Is Given by Abraham Hicks. And it says, this book, no one else can create in your experience. This book is about your realignment with source energy. It is about your reawakening to the clarity, goodness, and power that is really who you are. It is written to assist you in consciously returning to the knowledge that you are free and that you have always been free and that you will always be free to make your own choices. There is no satisfaction in allowing someone else to attempt to create your own reality. In fact, it is not possible for anyone else to create your reality. Once you have realigned with eternal forces and universal laws and with that which is truly the source of that which you are, then joyous creation beyond physical description awaits you. For you are the creator of your own experience and there is such satisfaction in intentionally guiding your own life. A few years ago, I had an issue with somebody that I worked with and he was, he was just, man, I'm going to tell you, this man put me through it. This man got me to my core issues really, really fast. I had to work third shift with him and it was hell on earth. Uh, so why would I create that in my experience? Why would I create that in my experience? Uh, so luckily for me, I have somebody who calls me on my bullshit and one of the things that that is a habit for me is being a victim or playing a victim or pretending to be a victim. I don't I don't see it. Hardly anybody sees this in themselves until they are faced with it. And then you start to see the wisdom of that. I don't have the habit of it of that too much anymore. <clears throat> but here's <laughs> so I called my friend and I explained to him uh, what was going on with this person. And he said, what are you getting out of this, Patrick? Oh, yeah, that's one of those questions. What are you getting out of this? And I and I immediately knew what he was talking about. I said, oh, I get to be a victim. Yes, nobody likes being a victim. But in today's world, there are certain perks that, that afford you if you are a victim. All that stuff is going away, so we're not even going to uh, uh, mess with that. Um, so nothing can affect you unless you allow it. And what happened with this guy is that he was the first person that I had ever sat down and said, stop, please stop what you're doing. Please stop. I've never been able to say that to anybody in my life. I've never been able to say people would scream at me and yell at me and, and all this stuff at me, abuse me, all this stuff, steal from me, rob me, mug me. And, and micromanage me. And, and so I told him, I said, please stop. You're not my boss. You're my coworker. 
I know what I'm doing. You do not have to micromanage me. And I'm going to tell you that when I when I sat down, I, this was the only option. I wasn't going to quit. He wasn't going to quit. But I wasn't going to live that way anymore. I wasn't going to be walking on eggshells around people anymore. And especially not him. And I sat him down and it was difficult. It was div. Oh my gosh, you don't, you do not know how difficult it was. <clears throat> so, so this person that I considered a nemesis, you might have one of those in your life. Um, he still continued to to harass and all of this, and and eventually I I got to the point where man, he must have some, he must have some things going on in his life, like he can't be this miserable. Nobody can be this miserable and still be alive. <clears throat> so eventually he quit and life moved on. And then I started seeing him around in public at meetings and stuff. And I saw him change. I saw him change from sort of a, a rough and tumble sort of complaining, obstinate person into a really kind man full of, of wisdom. And he was able to say that he was not taking very good care of himself at that time. He was dry. So he was projecting his inner misery. Um, and if those of you who don't know what dryness is or, or what it is, who it is, <laughs> dry, dryness is when you stop the addictive behavior such as alcohol or whatever. And you, then you still continue to live the way that you did when you were using, it's kind of like why you have to clean up your social life and clean up your language, clean all that stuff up because as addicts or alcoholics or people who are addicted to something, even candy crush saga, you can have sort of a messy life. You can have a lot of drama in your life because you're going to get the relief of a drink after work or a glass of wine or a bottle of wine or a binge watch of a show. But when you get sober and you don't have those things anymore, it can create some issues. And we're usually the last to know about those things because we can't see it and and no one else can create in your experience anyway. So I tell you that story because I got to, I got to see somebody change. I got to see someone change from being a hopeless case. Like no, nobody really even thought that he was going to make it. Uh, they thought the same thing of me too, but to watch that man go from blaming everything to realizing his role in everything and realizing that there's more to life than just being angry or upset or, or he actually genuinely started to make human connections and he turned into the kind of guy that was very giving, very open, very loving, would give a ride to people who didn't have cars or give a, give all these things. And he, he would come to the meetings that I was running and he would say, I, I feel at home here, Patrick, I feel at home. And it was, it was a wonderful, wonderful thing to witness. And, and in watching him change, I knew that people could change if they wanted to, I really hadn't had much evidence that people could change. I've seen a few people change. I myself have changed. My husband has changed. Uh, my brother-in-law has changed. My, my best friend has changed. I've seen people change, but no one who is this under the spell of ego and pain body and dryness to watch that man change was a, a, a living miracle. And I, and I no longer think that people can't change. I no longer think that it's not, that it's rare for people to change. I know people can change, but they have to want it because I can't create an another person's experience. So in telling you that story, I wanted you to, to see that all along the way, um, we both were creating in our own experience. He probably had similar uh, complaints about me, uh, that I didn't take things seriously or that I laughed a lot or, you know, sometimes pe that that puts people's teeth on edge if you're not taking things seriously, that they're taking things seriously. Uh, so but nothing can affect you unless you allow it. And I'm I don't know. I don't really know how to tell you this, but he died. That guy that, that I worked with, he died. 
And uh, it was sudden and it was out of nowhere and it really shook people up. And uh, I was looking forward to, to having him around in my life for years to come, just being this example. But I'm glad that he got to, to have that towards the end of his life. I'm, I'm glad he got to have that, uh, that peace and to be well remembered by everybody uh, instead of uh, being remembered as the asshole who uh, can't stop screaming at people. Um, so I'm glad that happened. And I'm not sad that he's he's gone because I know he has fully awakened to who he really is and is like, oh, shit, this is crazy, man. It is. It is crazy, man. Um, so in that story, I discovered why I was creating that experience in my life so that I could eventually get this lesson and this understanding. And a lot of times we create these sorts of painful or contrasting experiences in order for us to learn and grow from. Because if we choose to see it that way, we often turn out way better than we would have had we not gone through that experience. Because nothing bad happens unless you need it. Uh, if you need that something bad to happen, I will not get in the way of someone hitting their rock bottom. So one of the ways to realize that nothing can affect you, and in a way you're claiming your power, while at the same time admitting that you're powerless. Ooh, see this kind of stuff doesn't make, make sense in ego, doesn't make sense in ego consciousness at all. Um, but if you, if you realize this about yourself, let's go back over to this book. It says, you are eternal beings who have chosen to participate in this specific physical life experience for many wonderful reasons. And this time-space reality on planet Earth serves as a platform in which you are able to focus your perspective for the purpose of specific creation. You are eternal consciousness currently in this wonderful physical body for the thrill and exhilaration of specific focus and creation. The physical being that you define as you stands on the leading edge of thought while consciousness, which is really your source, pours through you. And in those moments of impressible elation, those are the times when you are wide open and truly allowing your source to express through you. All right. So we're going to do an exercise here. We're going to do an exercise. All right. Uh, so right now I want you to sort of stop what you're doing. If you're driving your car or washing your dishes or anything like that, let's get, let's get focused. If you're driving your car, wait till you get home. I just want you to just kind of sit here for a second. And I want you to think of something that you think is being done to you by someone or something else. Maybe the government, maybe the, a church, maybe a religion, maybe a homophobe or a transphobe or a, some somebody is doing something to you and you don't like it and it's affecting you. And this is, this is, I want you to think about that. I just want you to think about that. Kind of put that away because when we have a complaint about something, if we have a complaint about the world or anything going on in that, in that way, uh, we're actually drawing attention to it and we're making it worse. Uh, and this is very hard to get through to people, but I'll tell you, I used to think that people were homophobic and, and it, and it wasn't until I realized that I was being an alcoholic dick, uh, that people weren't homophobic. They just didn't like me. I was just an asshole. Uh, because homophobia is one of those things that's overgeneralizing people, people who overgeneralize things like that. They're not even hitting the target. There is so much more to me than the fact that I am gay. And now that I'm married, I, I can't even say, I don't even know if I'm gay because I just like one, one special someone. So it, it, it really doesn't even matter what people think I am or think who I am. But if I start to spend just five minutes in the presence of someone who needs there to be something like homophobia or transphobia or anti-Semitism or something, some name calling thing or some 
something that the violence is being done to this entire group of people. It, that's not true. It can't be true. It cannot be true. No person hates an entire group of people without being uh, provoked or seduced into doing so. So, so this is unpopular. This is very unpopular because when I try to, to help people, if they're, if they're like, people are calling me names or people, I say, Oh girl, I've been there, but what other people do doesn't matter, especially total strangers. Why would I give a shit? What a, what a total stranger thinks of me that they, they don't, they don't owe me anything. They could hate me. I don't care. Hate me. Lots of people have hated me over the years. I don't care. Call me a name. I don't care. And then, and then if you think that this is going to, going to encourage or result in some sort of violence, you obviously don't know how powerful you are. And if anything like that happens to you, what is it teaching you? Nothing can affect you unless you allow it. That's a spiritual truth. We can sit here and argue that until the cows come home. But if, if, if the government outlaws cows, we're going to be waiting here for a long, long time. <laughs> Nothing can affect you unless you allow it. So, so I'm talking about negative stuff here, aren't I? Or, or you might think it's negative stuff, like pulling, pulling your focus into what's going on in your reality is highly suggested during this exercise. Okay. Just pull your focus in, pull it in. There, there are people out there that are trying to manage wars and, and famines and, animals. <laughs> this is a lot to manage and, and it splits your energy into all these different areas. And it's like, why, what are we doing? If I can't create in another person's experience, why am I spending so much of my time learning about it or trying to do it or helping someone or because that's not the way that this reality works. If you are worried about the starving kids in Afra, Africa, Get on a plane and go make them sandwiches. That's what you can do. But what if I told you there weren't any starving kids in Africa? And whenever I talk about this, people go, oh, there, though, there are pictures, there are things on the internet. And it's like, if it's not happening to you, it's not happening to you. This is about staying in your lane in a, in a divine way. And, and if no one can create in your experience, if you're afraid to say that, are you afraid that something bad might happen to you? Well, fear comes from the ego. So your ego is afraid of something bad happening to you because if something bad happens to you, it might just knock the ego out of relevance. <laughs> it might just go pop. So that's why the ego is afraid of these transformative experiences. The ego is terrified of you figuring this out. It's going to, it's going to dig in. It's going to be very painful uh, until you decide, Hey, why am I letting this shit affecting me? It's up to you. It is your responsibility. Now that could, that could make you feel free or it could make you feel on the spot. It could make you say, Patrick, you're full of shit. You can say all of these things to me and that's fine. You can call me names. I call myself names. You can call me by pronouns. That I, that I, I don't care. Where did that come from? Being happy with who you are. I am me. And if you don't see me for the real me, why bother? You see? So if nothing can affect you unless you allow it, why would you allow it? Abraham says, absolute well-being is the basis of your universe. Well-being is the basis of all that is. It flows to you and through you. You have only to allow it. Like the air you breathe, you have only to open, relax, and draw it into your being. This book is about consciously allowing your natural connection to the stream of well-being. It is about remembering who you really are so that you can get on with the creation of your life experience in the way you intended before you came forth into this physical body and into this magnificent, 
leading edge experience where you fully intended to express your freedom in endless, joyous, co-creative ways. Can you understand how much well-being is flowing to you? Do you understand how much orchestration of circumstances and events on your behalf is available to you? Do you understand how adored you are? Do you understand how the creation of this planet, the creation of this universe fits together for the perfection of your experience? Wow. Wow. I've had personal experiences where I realized how, how loved I am by the universe and some very ancient, uh, spirits and uh, guardian spirits. I know that I'm, I'm adored and loved just as much as you are adored and loved. So what's, what's, what's happening? Why can't we realize this about ourselves? So one of the teachings that I, that is a foundational teaching in concrete shamanism is the evidence that you love yourself. If you're looking out at your life and if you're, you're in poverty or lack consciousness, you obviously don't love yourself. If you're enduring relationships with people that don't fulfill you, you're, you, you obviously don't love yourself. If you're not willing to uh, take a chance on life and let God catch you, cause he will totally, totally will, will catch you. If you're not willing to take those risks and let, and let the universe show off for, for you, it's, it's going to be this sort of dull, dry, brittle, experience full of complaining and resentment and all of that stuff. So if you can learn to love yourself and all of its glory and all of, all of the things that are going on with you, you're going to be changing for the rest of your life. And this is a wonderful thing to realize. If you don't love yourself, that's gotta, you gotta do that first. You gotta figure out a way uh, to love yourself. Do you understand how beloved you are, how blessed you are, how adored you are, and what an integral part of this creative process you are? We want you to. We want you to begin to understand the blessed nature of your being, and we want you to begin to look for the evidence of it because we are showing it to you in every moment that you will allow yourselves to see it in the lining up of lovers, money, fulfilling experiences, and beautiful things for you to see in the lining up of circumstances and events and in the lining up of amazing co-creative experiences where you are rendezvousing with one another for no other reason than for the fantastically important reason of fulfilling, satisfying, and pleasing yourself and giving yourself joy in the moment. Your motion forward is inevitable. It must be. You cannot help but move forward, but you are not here on a quest to move forward. You are here to experience outrageous joy. That is why you are here. Mm -mm -mm. I can't say it. Can't say it any plainer. Isn't it, isn't it awesome when you finally realize what's going on? <sighs> Absolute well-being is the basis of your universe. It can't be any other way. It cannot be any other way. Okay. Before we, before we end today's video, I want to go over to the, the Power States deck. We are almost ready to launch this deck and this website. Um, and this deck kind of came to us like a spiritual technology, and it helps you reach powerful states of being like fun, joy, contentment, harmony, love, clarity, peace, serenity, and abundance. Uh, and also achievement of those things. And how this deck works is that you flip over that. Number one, making it a game. Uh, making it a game is really important because if life can, life can get tedious, life can get dull, it can get boring, unless you realize that you at any moment you can make it into a game. You can make it into a game. It's pretty easy, like what we're doing with this card deck. Uh, making it a game. So it says, transform the mundane into the extraordinary by injecting the element of play. View challenges as levels to conquer. Mundane tasks as quests and milestones as achievements to unlock. Create a point system for daily tasks. Invent characters or stories around routine activities or set up friendly competitions with yourself or others to add an element of play 
to everyday life. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to take take a, a moment here to tell you that we've got we've got a really fun ego event coming up next year, and we're going to get be giving out awards. Uh, we're going to call it the Person of the Year Awards. So please sign up for our mailing list so that you could be on on. You might be getting an award as Person of the Year, or if yeah, okay. So so back over here. So the the middle card is about the powerful state of fun that you're going to be achieving. Now, when you turn these codes cards over, you're going to ignore this little symbol at the top uh, because these two cards are going to help you make it a game. So let's see, deciding on the day. This is one of those cards where you just decide to decide on the day. Begin each morning by affirming your intention for joy. Visualize your day unfolding with laughter, smiles, and contentment. All right. And then over here we have being selfish. Ooh, this is a good one because being selfish is not bad at all. And, and if somebody told you that being selfish was bad, um, they were they were the they were just trying to keep you from realizing that being selfish is actually good for you. Let's see what this means. <clears throat> it's okay to put your needs first sometimes. Practicing pra practicing self compassion and self priority can lead to greater contentment in life. Say no to demands that drain your energy. Take time for activities that you enjoy and replenish your energy. Uh, so here, this this reading right here means how to make it a game. Decide on the day that you're going to make it a game and be selfish. Put your needs first. This is what you need today. Like, and I, and I get it. If you were raised in an alcoholic home like me or a, or a narcissistic or a toxic dysfunctional home, you don't know how to do any of this shit. You're going to have to, to learn it yourself. You might as well take a life skills course because if you don't know how to put your needs first, that was programmed into you. That people pleasing, you were programmed to be a little little servant or a romantic fill in. So sort that out first. Go to therapy. Uh, get get coaching. Whatever you can do to emerge out of that. There's a lot of good uh, support groups out there. There's Al Anon. There's ACA. But I think the adult children of alcoholics. But I think the best thing to do is to just realize it that people may have taught you things that that you didn't necessarily know that were not true. But then again, no one else can create in your experience. Nothing can affect you unless you allow it. And so here's the, here's the final thing we're going to talk about here. Um, we want to, when we, when we talk about being raised in an alcoholic home or when we talk about narcissistic parenting or, or anything like that, we are not blaming those people at all. And let's get this clear because I am here today because I was raised in an alcoholic home. I am here today because my parents hid an addiction from me. My entire family, I'm, I, I come from a nest of addicts, insidious drug addicts that keep it all on the down low and that nobody will ever know about it. And when I first got into treatment, somebody said, your parents screwed you up, dude. Like, I'm like, what do I do now? Got to be your own parent. Get to be your own parent. Because this is the major thing about the law of attraction and contrast and all of that. If you had a shitty childhood, well, guess what? You're one of the X-Men. You have superpowers now. But unless you realize that you had a crappy, gaslighty, shitty childhood, you'll, you'll be a victim of that for the rest of your life. And, and, and if you like being a victim... Go right ahead, but I think it's far easier to take responsibility for what's going on in your life. And I think it's and it's completely fine if you want to seal yourself off from matrix-oriented people or people who watch enemy propaganda. <laughs> and I would say enemy propaganda is, this world is a physical world. This world has wars. This world is full of disease. This world Because if you're able to see through all that bullshit and see the, the truth and the heart of it, that nothing happens in God's reality by mistake, that when you claim, when you complain about something in God's reality, you're complaining about the perfection of God's handiwork. You ready to get there? You ready to do that kind of work? If you're not, you can't hang out with people. <laughs> <laughs> you will be challenged. But then again, nothing can affect you uh, if you don't allow it. So whenever somebody comes up to me and they're like, oh, Patrick, 
Ooh, Lord, there's this disease going around. Ooh, Lord. Mm, Patrick, Patrick. Oh, gosh. There's things happening in, in countries that I've never heard of before. But, ooh, we got to do something. Somebody comes into, into my experience like that. I just listen. I just listen. They're going to get it eventually. They are. So God's got them on a, on a level, much in the same way that I tell addicts. I'm like, well, God's got you on a level that you really don't understand. So what's, what's the worst thing that's going to happen to you? You're, you're going to die, uh, or you're going to get sick and die, or, uh, you're going to have an accident and die. Um, you're going to get sick. Something's going to happen and you're going to die, but you're, but you're going to live until you die. So you may as well live happily ever after because you're going to like Abraham says, you're going to live ever after you may as well try to at least be happy ever after. And that you can't lie to yourself over this either. There are people out there that go, I'm fine. I'm fine. The, the we're fine guys. Ooh, those we're fine guys, man. But nothing can affect you unless you allow it and listen and ask yourself, what is it teaching you? What is it teaching you? The big lesson that's coming up for a lot of us is compassion for those who have not yet woken up to what's going on. The great awakening. It's incredible to be alive during this time. I want you to have a lovely day and uh, thank you for checking us out.